Hello everybody. Very warm welcome to this webinar. I'm Linda Amran Cooper from the University of London and I'm delighted to welcome you to our very exciting panel um, and event this afternoon. If we could go to the agenda slide, please. So the topic of our event this afternoon is the future of social, creative and experiential digital learning. As universities and colleges around the globe move forward with plans for teaching and assessment in the autumn, they are faced with the challenges presented by the pandemic. But there can be no doubt that there are also tremendous opportunities for us all to take bold new steps in reconceptualizing learning to harness the power of digital. And to meet this opportunity, we need to understand how innovative digital learning can generate engagement and success to release the potential of all of our learners. I'm delighted, therefore, to welcome you to an event that will see well, that will set the future of social, creative and experiential digital learning firmly at the heart of the discussion. We have a remarkable international panel with us today, so I will only take a moment to introduce you to the colleagues that we have present. So we're going to start with Sam and then we'll be introduced to Matt, Whitney, Iona and Tierney. We'll take a break uh, for about 10 minutes because we want to take the opportunity to field to our panel the very best questions that we've received from the panel, from the audience. So just to remind you, you can access the audience questions by clicking on the uh, button with a question mark on it that opens up uh, the question area for you. After we've had the question session, we'll then ask our panels to reconvene and to pick up on some of the key themes that have been raised. And we'll be inviting our host from Goldsmiths University, Mark Deverno, to close the event for us. OK, so thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this afternoon. And I'd like to welcome Sam Brenton, Director of Education, Innovation and Development at the University of London. Thank you, Linda. And hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Bonjour. So new transformative technologies drive new developments in distance education. Uh, I have a slide there with some pretty pictures showing some of those technologies through the ages. There they are. On the top left there, I've got the Rosetta Stone. And what was the invention of writing, if not the original form of distance learning? There's a, a London post box there. And the postal service in different countries fueled early correspondence courses, and it actually enabled the University of London's original model to exist uh, around 160 years ago. Uh, today we have about 50,000 students around the world all studying online. And the advent of television heralded great claims for the disruption of formal higher education, some of which are familiar to us today. It didn't quite happen, but many of us will remember the Open University lectures late at night on BBC Two. And TV remains one of the most powerful educational mediums today. Uh, for example, I learnt my alphabet from Sesame Street rather than from school. And I still say Z rather than Z to this day. And now today, the Internet remains the defining transformative technology of our age. In the generation since it came into our daily lives, it's affected the world and how we live in profound ways and the ways in which people learn are forever changed by it. But the way we teach in higher education, though altered, has been slower to adapt. And online learning, by and large, looks familiar today to anyone who was doing it 15 to 20 years ago. Still, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, a linear progression of web pages, video, graphics, quizzes, discussions and assessment points. 
For a while, there were prognostications of imminent apocalypse, avalanches and disruptive innovation and the death of the campus and the year of the MOOC, etc. But the dreaming spires stood intact. And by and large, we've seen a slow integration of digital practice into campus based models an evolution rather than a revolution. And even some of the new approaches being talked about today, such as those outlined in JISC's Education 4.0 in the UK, are not themselves substantially new. For example, if we use new technology like VR, surely we want to do more with it than to watch PowerPoint presentations in VR. So I think we've barely begun to see the possibilities. And then suddenly, in a few short e weeks, the pandemic achieved what market forces and a generation of slow advance in digital higher education couldn't achieve. Campuses closed, international flows of students are stilled for the foreseeable future, and examination halls were empty or converted into field hospitals. An avalanche indeed, sudden and devastating. So we saw the online pivot as HE around the world adapted suddenly to an atomized world where physical interaction was no longer an option. Faculties and their students were distributed in space and connected only by the digital. We are all distance learners now. The ingenuity of individual teachers and their institutions was tested and almost miraculously, we kept things going with what we had to hand. And now, as we slowly and timidly emerge at differing speeds around the world. We don't know what the future brings, but it's a fair bet that things won't go back to normal as we knew normal to be. And there's a distinction emerging between emergency remote teaching on the one hand and intentional designed online learning on the other. And this is also wrapped up in the age old debate about the value of the lecture as a delivery mode and crudely put, whether our job is to transmit information to be memorised or to assist students to construct meaning and knowledge for themselves in collaboration. But here's the problem, as I see it, with too much of what we still do, and I'll return to the images on the slide. Uh, the middle and the bottom row there, that wooden box, um, that I don't know if anyone recognises it, but that's B.F. Skinner's teaching machine. Um, B.F. Skinner, the great uh, American behaviourist of the, of the 50s. Pre-microchip, this was a machine that fed you material and then asked you questions about that material. And depending on your answers, you could move to the next step in the sequence or you'd be returned to an earlier stage to redo it or you'd branch off into revisionary material to help you master the step that you're on. So it was a behavioristic vision of technology enhanced learning, but quite familiar to some of the ways we talk about adaptive learning today, funnily enough. And I think that all too often our online courses still resemble this model, whether intentionally designed or not. So we have a moment of opportunity now. And isn't it always the way that, that the time of maximum opportunity comes at the time of maximum fatigue and peril and financial constraint? But let's use this opportunity to invent new models which use the true power of the web as it was originally conceived. Uh, not just as a wondrous mass publishing mechanism, not just as a content distribution network, but as a vast shifting array of human communication networks, transcending time and space in a way that no technology before allowed us to do. Excuse me? So let's open up the walls and learn from how people learn outside formal education, rather than craft our understanding of digital pedagogy within a narrow band of practice that's actually not very much like anything found out there in the world. Let's fit our teaching and our course structures and our credit frameworks and our funding policies and our timetables and our approach to content and our learning activity design and our admissions procedures to that world out there online, rather than ask the billions of online learners around the world because we're doing, we're living our lives online now substantially to fit in with our custom and practice. Higher education is still not web shaped and to make best use of the web's possibilities, I propose that we need to change our shape to it. And if we don't, I fear that we may miss out on a unique opportunity to re revise that original utopian promise of the web, 
to transcend cultural and national barriers, to democratize and meritocratize, to reach people who've been excluded from the transformative power of higher education. It's not so much about this or that technology, or whether there's a place for Zoom lectures and an intentional learning design. Our online courses are not our tools or platforms, just as a traditional university is not its campus or its classrooms, but is its people. So I think putting social experiential online learning uh, to the core is, is, is not just about the design of discrete activities, um, but I think we need to reimagine how we feel education could be through that lens. It's terribly vague in general, I know, and I'm sure we'll see concrete examples of how colleagues are doing just that sort of thing today. Um, but that's how I've been thinking about the challenge ahead of us and how we might reimagine higher education at this time of rapid change and huge volatility, but also great opportunity. And that's what I wanted to, to share with you today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Really interesting, very exciting, significant opportunities. And I, I love that uh, re reframing of the discussion. So we're going to turn to Matt Dane-Baker now, um, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, Thomas Jefferson University. Thank you, Matt. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on um, which side of the uh, ocean you're on and uh, it's um, my pleasure to be here to um, and uh, next slide. Uh, so. So I just wanted to frame what I'm going to focus on based on what is Thomas Jefferson University. We um, because it'll help to uh, put my comments in context um, where uh, uh, pretty new. We started in 1824. We're a very large enterprise, but we're made up of 14 hospitals and a um, and a college a university system, which has several campuses and um, about 10,000 learners altogether. The most important part, I think, to frame it is what are our professional focus areas? We're not a liberal arts institution. We are um, very much a professional institution with 56 different health and medicine type programs, the medical school and 55 other health related programs. We have about 30 architecture and design majors and then some science and tech engineering and fashion and textiles. Um, the next slide. Thank you. So as everybody else, uh, COVID was a major disruption in March. We had to, uh, within six to 14 days, depending on the program, put 27, um, uh, 2,737 courses online within a few days. These are classes, labs, studios, um, group learning seminars of all sorts, and um, people on clinical rotations. And this, uh, for us and for our major signature pedagogies in medicine and design left us with some amazingly interesting challenges, which turned out to be, I think, great opportunities for innovation. And I'm going to share some of those now. Um, and I'm going to not focus on lectures and labs and groups and engagement because I think other people will do that. I'm really going to focus on the design studio and critique experience and on the um, healthcare pedagogy experience. And so we within a, a few hours realized that um, in a, a, a in a curriculum that is based on um, genetically uh, genetically uh, um, manipulated mice and uh, cadavers and sewing machines and 3D printers um, and that it would be very, very hard to put this all online and we were able to do it with uh, I think a great deal of innovation. We have a lot of online programs, but those are mostly lecture based uh, programs in the business school and in the public health school. So let's start with um, um, studios. Uh, this studio experience is uh, whether it's fashion design or architecture, interior design or graphic design. It involves around a small group experience. 
It involves around prototyping equipment, but it also involves an assessment system called crits or critiques where the faculty member um, walks around, where they put things up from maybe their CAD or computer assisted um, design. And then the faculty member draws all over that and gives and then other experts come in and students come in and give these critiques that had to go online and we had to figure out a way to do that relatively quickly for the health side. And we'll talk about how we do that in a couple of minutes or in a minute um, for the health side. We are heavily dependent, besides on clinical rotations in the hospitals and clinics, on simulation, which is either high fidelity simulation with hundred to three hundred thousand dollar robots, um, or low fidelity trainers to teach people how to put in intravenous catheters and nasogastric tubes and other things. Skills training for how to do a physical exam, which is basically a demonstration followed by students um, actually uh, um, practicing on each other, all of these uh, listening to the lungs, taking a blood pressure neurologic exam, and then a very special um, type of assessment called OSCEs, which are objective structured clinical exams where a person goes into what looks like a uh, an exam room where they would in the real world in a clinic and they see a standardized patient, essentially an actor acting out symptoms and then they diagnose and treat them and come out and write the note. So these are all based on the physical environment and a lot of technology and a lot of live people. So as far as the, the crits, was very, very interesting how we uh, chose to do that. We went, used many different technologies like Collaborate and um, Zoom, of course, and Autodesk, uh, the, the AutoCAD and the Adobe Creative Suite. But we realized that the one thing we couldn't do was this thing where you draw over somebody else's CAD. So we started to use uh, uh, pad devices, three types, we, we played with Surface and um, the Apple iPad Pro and the, uh, the Wacom, where a professor could draw on a, a student's uh, design and show them different things that they wanted to point out in a critique. And then other students could all join in in a live uh, um, session along with other uh, other experts, outside expert architects or designers. As far as the health side, uh, it got a little bit um, complicated, but it was it, it turned out to be uh, fairly amazing. We were able to film demonstrations and have a lot of different uh, videos that we were able to demonstrate certain things. And then we did a thing called in situ training where we had a training kit which students took home. And this is uh, anything from a handhold ultrasound device that fits on the probe, fits on their iPhone to an intravenous arm. And a student had a kit that went to their home and then they had a live demonstration on Zoom where the faculty member would walk them through it for physical exam. They saw demonstrations online and then they were able to actually examine a knee of a family member and then be, um, be critiqued on um, that sort of things. We also, uh, for the um, standardized patients, these actors, we had them live. You couldn't examine them, but uh, they could take a, a very thorough history and uh, then tell the instructor and the other students in the group what you would do in the physical exam. And then the instructor would say what the physical findings would be. And then you could um, come up with a diagnosis and treatment plan worked out pretty well. There is a lot of online um, cases um, from a variety of different companies like iHuman and Aquafir that we were able to purchase and then we uh, created our own. So it turned out um, pretty well. We were able to keep people on simulated clinical rotations and do all the things we had to do with the two signature pedagogies that uh, that we deal with a lot. And so that would um, pretty much and my comments and some of our special opportunities for innovation and challenges. Thank you. Could you still have one minute, Matt, but that will do. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating and, and, and highly creative, Matt, really creative. Thank you for that. Um,
We're going to turn now to Whitney. Whitney Kilgore, co-founder and chief academic officer of iDesign. Whitney. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanted to start with just a couple of thoughts. Um, piggybacking off of what Sam said earlier, there's an opportunity to take some bold new steps. And when I think about online course design, I think about it as an opportunity for online innovation in pedagogy. And um, when I'm working with faculty or our organization is working with faculty, we take, an, we take that opportunity to really reflect on what we want that student experience to look like and to feel like. Who are the students? What should they be able to do at the end of the program? How should they speak about their experience in that, that learning opportunity? And, and so as we think about what happened during this quick pivot to remote teaching, it really didn't allow for that pedagogical innovation. And so to Sam's point earlier, um, budget constraints uh, and, and, and fatigue and all of these factors that we have at play right now really allow for a, a, a critical kind of strategic mass of forces to impact what we're doing right now and allow us to be more creative maybe than we've ever been before in this higher education space and and be able to think differently and and explore these tool sets that we have and push on what we did in the spring in order to take it to that next level and to be able to innovate and 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 move into a direction that is more humanized, that is more polished and is more authentic and genuine and, and, and feels more like a robust learning experience than what happened in the spring. And so I'm very excited about the opportunity we have right now to do things better and to do things differently. Um, I, I got excited listening to Sam speak earlier. I was extremely motivated by his comments because I think the affordances that we have in the technology tools of today allow us to advance our ability to, to connect digitally. Um, in ways that we didn't have previously. If, if COVID had come 20 years ago, we would not have the ability to do what we can do right now, but we really have to think about teaching and learning first and then pick the right tool for the job. And so, you know, I really wanna think about the student first so uh, all of what we do is student-centered learning, but the conversations I've been having over the last three months, three and a half months now, I guess, are around changes to the field of instructional design as a whole. Uh, three and a half months ago, the conversations I was having with instructional designers was all about fatigue, be feeling undervalued, underutilized, under misunderstood, and um, and leaders not knowing what they did, how they were supposed to be utilized. They, they really weren't seen as change agents. And fast forward to March, insert date here, depending on what side of the pond you're on, and all that changed in a moment. And instructional designers were the people on the front lines of higher education. They were the change agents. They were the people that you called to get the help, the support, the care, to be able to help move the needle and be able to keep your classes moving forward. So in higher education, uh, instructional designers were the new uh, frontline workers, the essential workers in higher education. Uh, but they were also then, they went from being, I'll say, um, uh, burnt out to even more so burnt out. So many of the instructional designers I was talking to here in the U.S. were working 18 and 20 hour days. It, it never ended. And so I saw a, a post in Inside Higher Ed. It was probably about a month ago or so. And it said the hot new job in higher education is instructional design. So now the instructional designers are understood and the role is highly sought after and there are new jobs in the space. 
the, the, the job, the role is changing and it is going to continue to be wildly sought after. So there are going to be sweeping changes in the field of instructional design as a whole. So that's, that's a spot to watch, uh, especially as we need to create more and more online blended hybrid solutions. Um, as I'm having more and more conversations with provosts and, and presidents and institutions about what support they need going forward, thinking about fall and beyond, uh, as, we, as we continue to move into the summer, institutions are making more and more decisions about what's going to happen this fall. Many institutions were very slow to announce what they were going to do this fall. Uh, many institutions said, yes, we're going to be on campus. Uh, we're hearing more and more institutions say, actually, many of our classes will be online or blended. Our terms will be shortened. There'll be six week rolling terms or there'll be two seven week terms fitting into what would be a traditional semester. Only the lab courses will be face to face and there'll be smaller sections of those. The fall looks very different at multiple institutions and that's to keep those class size smaller. Um, plexiglass is going up in front of the instructors. I'm hearing of faculty, um, uh, uh, unions coming together, concerned about the faculty experience and whether or not they will be safe in their classrooms. There's lots of concerns uh, in talking with parents about what they want to be able to do for their children this fall, uh, even parents of those individuals that are leaders of online learning. There's a lot of concern about what's going to happen for their own children, whether they're going to put them into online programs, whether they're sending them to campus. Uh, many of my colleagues that work in online units at universities are saying their, their students are going to be going to school online. Uh, several of my uh, colleagues have responded that their students are going to go back to campus, they think, but their, their institution hasn't announced yet. Uh, so I think at this point in time, I'm very curious to see what the fall looks like for many of my colleagues. My child has decided to go to school fully online, uh, and I, I, I'm very curious to see uh, what the rest of the world does. Uh, when it comes to what we need to do going forward, We've got to build more fully online programs that are truly humanized, that have robust student learning experiences, where those lab and hands-on experiences can be in clinical and face-to-face um, -face environments. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Re really interesting. And th the feeling this, this, in this session is definitely of excitement and opportunity that are being presented, which is which is really good. Thank you for those ideas and the thoughts and, and our, our new change agents. Um, Iona, might I invite you next to present? So Iona Silver Fletcher, Professor in Veterinary Education at the Royal Veterinary College and a colleague of mine working within the Centre for Distance Education at the University of London as well. Welcome, Iona. Thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a, it's a great opportunity to join this, this moment, this transformation we are all in the middle of. We are all experiencing very similar aspects of challenges, very similar uh, uh, solutions we are trying to force our way through. And listening to Matt in the healthcare section, which where we are in largely trying to get our students onto um, practical sessions and the, the the challenge is huge. So what I wanted what I wanted to focus on very much was on uh, can I have the next slide please um, about um, student engagement in online teaching and learning. I mean this is something we have been talking about a, a lot and we have talked about this in the distance and online uh, pedagogy and in the face to face pedagogy. What has happened over the last uh, 20, 30 years is we have almost come to a point that the pedagogy has diverged. We talk about um, online engagement and we talk about engagement in the face to face sex uh, classroom practical sessions. And now is the, uh, the transformation that has been merging and trying to see where the challenges are in trying to merge this. Next slide, please. So the, um, the 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 very much what we have all been talking about the student centered active experiential learning and we have worked out very well how to do it online how to do it face to face and there are 
challenges in moving the learners who are used to one form to the other form. And what happened overnight when we had to move all our online learners to uh, uh, all our face to face learners to online. The, the challenge was the faculty in a way because they were used to teaching uh, using face to face modalities, a very good pedagogy developed for face to face now to uh, online mode and then the design is key. I agree with uh, uh, all the previous speakers. Design is fundamental, but design takes time and that transformation in 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 making the design applicable for face to face learners has been the biggest challenge. It's costly, it's resource heavy, it's time heavy and uh, over the years in online and digital pedagogy, we have become to value synchronous learning because synchronous learning is where um, students get together and there's a social learning, there's co-construction of knowledge and the value is enormous. So synchronous modes have developed synchronous. There are lots of tools developed for synchronous uh, learners and that also helps to create the community of learners and isolation, which has been identified as a major uh, challenge in distance learning have been have been approached. And I think we have ways of creating that community of learners and there have been many tools to drive that interaction from Padlet to uh, various other forms which we have used. So what I would like to look in a little bit more detail is what really happens in the classroom setting. So can I have the next slide, please? This is this is a typical example of a small group uh, teaching session. So on the left, you can see uh, the learners are all intently listening to the facilitator and the facilitator is uh, aware the student. They're making good eye contact, the body language, all that and the on the right, you can see the students are now on video. Some are on video, some are not even on videos. And this is a typical small group teaching session. The facilitator cannot make eye contact and facilitator don't know what they're doing. And now we have to move into a, a virtual world where we are using tools without that physical presence of to, trying to trying to solve the physical presence. So the, um, the the one tool that I'm listing here is MindMeister, which is a mind mapping software. There are many tools out there, but the challenge is getting the students to do use these tools. That's the that's the other challenge that uh, one has to address and then getting the teachers who are used to face to face teaching to understand that it is the value is in using these online tools, which some some of our younger learners are much more savvy, not not so much the mature learners. But how do you get that space and how do you get the pedagogy of synchronous learning active and effective to move forward? And this is this is just one example of of, of uh, where we have we, we have solved the problem temporarily at least uh, in, in moving forward to the uh, next term. But the biggest challenges in large animal, for example, practical teaching, how do you create that sense of uh, challenge, physical presence of an animal which you cannot do online? There are so many other factors involved in teaching around uh, large animals, for example. So they are they're, they're, warning, Ayona. They are the future challenges to come, and uh, I think uh, I, I I I was greatly enthused by Matt's presentation. How uh, how the uh, resource using various resources and technologies by allowing students to take home simulated simulations, how a teacher can lead through. So there's there's I think there's a, there's many challenges to overcome. And I agree with the previous presenters. If this COVID has happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, we will not be 
learning and teaching of uh, students the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Iona. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting the, those questions of how we take out the skills that we have in face to face teaching in terms of monitoring our students physical and emotional responses into an online domain. So thank you for that. And I hope we will have a chance to discuss that somewhat further. Um, uh, I, I think we have our, our last speaker on the line. Can we go back to our slides? Brilliant. OK, so Tierney is Chief Digital Officer at Lichnam. I'm sorry, my French is very, very, very poor, as everybody can obviously notice straight away. Uh, but very warm welcome, Thierry. Um, and I'll hand over to you, if I may. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ulip and Goldsmith to offering me the opportunity to present at this seminar. Uh, just a comment about webinars. Um, I have performed a few during the, the crisis, and the main difficulty is to have to no feedback at all from the audience. Uh, where are the people nodding or smiling or not smiling, what is, which is worse when you are making a joke? And thank you for the presenter to, to smile. Um, so my position at LUCNAM is a Chief Digital Officer. I run the Office for Digital Users for Pedagogy. There's two teams. One team is made up of instructional designers who help teachers to move online. And one team is dedicated to MOOC productions. So please, for the next slide. So uh, I have prepared two slides uh, as a guideline for my talk, and here are some key figures from the LUCNAM. But I won't comment at length uh, uh, on these figures. Um, just please note the motto of the CLAM on the right uh, logo, uh, on, on the right logo uh, down. Uh, it's, it's a Latin uh, motto, motto, which is Omnes Docet Ubique, one teaches everyone everywhere. It was chosen uh, on the beginning of the 19th century and it's a perfect definition for distance learning, isn't it? Um, so, um, uh, before the lockdown, um, we, we have uh, uh, we have 55,000 uh, learners, and this I don't say student because uh, LUCNAM is a public higher education dedicated to lifelong learning, so it's mainly continuous learning and vocational learning. Uh, so 30% of our uh, um, education units uh, courses uh, are distance learning and uh, we have produced 55 MOOCs. Uh, and after the lockdown, something which we are very proud of, we went up to 95% of fa from face-to-face -face courses to uh, distance learning. So it was really, really a big challenge. Um, so we set up webinars and there was some video um, involved, um, transferred to, to the new platform. Hopefully we had a new platform in, in January. And uh, um, I, I haven't, uh, one key figure, figure is missing that um, uh, in the middle of March, uh, at the beginning of the, of the crisis, we went from uh, 60 daily virtual classrooms to 900 daily. It was really um, uh, something, and I, I would like to uh, deeply thank the, the technicians and engineers who operate the CNAM data center. Our release, release, resilience sorry, uh, to the crisis was only possible thanks to them. Please, on the next slide. Okay. Uh, so, three thoughts about the consequences of this COVID crisis on the higher education, educational, education technology, higher ed tech. First of all is uh, how are we capitalize, capitalizing uh, our digital usage practices? So that means during the, the crisis, 
So teachers were forced to use digital uh, tools such as LMS, virtual classrooms, video servers, and so on. Uh, and the in our instructional designers have provided webinars and online tutorials. But um, the basic move was uh, to turn the classes in attendance into virtual classes. So uh, what we are doing now, a webinar is a sort of virtual classes. Um, classroom. So, but our learners are not students and they uh, mainly attend evening courses uh, in face to face. So, this synchronous uh, modality was reassuring re for them. But some of our teachers were already quite skilled at distance learning, so that they were ready to use all the tools we are providing, such as the learning management system, the LMS Moodle. And just a remark, as uh, Moodle is, is really the number one open source LMS in the world, uh, have a look at stats.moodle.org. Uh, there are more than uh, 200 million users in the world and more than 1 billion enrollments uh, on, on Moodle uh, just right now as we are speaking. Uh, and the, the, the teacher, they were able to use uh, the virtual classes on, on uh, virtual classroom on Big Blue Button, but also on Teams as O365 is uh, um, deployed in, at LUCNAM. So they could also use Office Online, OneDrive uh, file sharing and forms. So uh, one of the main issue we had is uh, that some of them use free tools um, is in, uh, uh, and it's a problem. Uh, in the consistency of the uh, institu institution's information system. We uh, need to track uh, the learners, the vocational training funders that require proof or learning. So uh, this is my day-to-day -day, uh, fight uh, to be uh, sure that the tools that are used are within the information system. Um, and after uh, synchronous and, and uh, uh, pure uh, distance learning rules have collaborative work um, be between uh, the learners, such as forum, peer to peer assessments, and digital workshop. So, One minute uh, warning, uh, yes, at LOCNAM, we are already ready to experiment uh, virtual reality for vocational training, uh, assessment of technical gesture. Um, and I fully agree with Whitney's presentation. Uh, the instructional designers are the change agents. Uh, the role um, of the pedagogical, um, pedagogical um, instructional designer was to convince teachers to use the LMS and to gradually change their pedagogical practices. But now uh, they are becoming a project manager uh, because um, the COVID crisis has. Uh, uh, affected um, um, the the we, we now have call for projects from the French government uh, to uh, produce blended learning courses. So uh, project management into this vast program will be a, a, a challenge. So the COVID crisis has profoundly affected the use of the higher education technologies, and now we must be ready to face the challenges of major changes in our educa education systems, but also in our economy and our way of life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So again, we see the, the rise of the instructional designer, which is, is, is a really interesting theme that's appearing this afternoon, among others. So what we're going to do now, colleagues, is, is take a, a short break. And when we come back, we'll start to put the questions to our panel um, and to get the interaction going. Colleagues, welcome back. I hope you've had an opportunity to stretch your legs or grab a drink or read the exciting questions that we've had submitted. There is a lot there. So I'm going to take the liberty, if I may, of summarising some of the questions and, uh, and putting them to our panel. So um, one of the issues that is most definitely raising concern and question within our audience and I believe within the wider sector is the question of um, 
one might call it the digital divide. How we ensure that students who don't have access to the right equipment or the right space in which to learn or the right internet connections can access our exciting social um, experiential digital future. So I'd like to start, if I may, by asking anyone on the panel who would like to step in to address that question. Um, it's a big question and I, I recognise that uh, it's quite a challenge for us to consider the answers to some of that. But if anybody would like to respond, they're very welcome to. If not, I will choose a panel member. I'm, I'm happy to chip in, Linda. Thanks, um, Sam. Yeah, it's it's real. It's a real problem. The digital divide, digital poverty. Uh, we've seen uh, data poverty as well. And some of the assumptions about about the developed world as opposed to the developing world are, are have been proven to be unfounded. We have a real issue around data poverty and digital inequality in the UK. Um, not just that, but also access to technology and space to study and so on and so forth. Um, it's a real issue. Uh, we haven't got a we haven't got one solution for it. Uh, your own solution will, I think, depend on your political point of view of, about these things. Um, the online learning, digital learning, education at large reflects the society and the societies in which it happens. You know, so, um, but I, I think it's important to 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 bear in mind the fact that overall, this is a form of education that is good for access. Um, the same questions about inequality and exclusion apply to traditional university campus-based education through, in slightly different ways through a slightly different lens. So. My, my kind of headline conclusion is that, that online learning is net positive in terms of access, but it doesn't and can't in itself solve the structural inequalities present in society. Thank you, Sam. Um, was there another member of the panel who wanted to talk a little bit about that or respond to that? I think I, I can at least address what we tried to do for for folks that did not have or people who didn't have the necessary equipment. We did lend out through our library and through our technology department laptops and tablets for people to sign out and take home. Uh, that did not address all the Internet access issues, which we found much harder to address because students who take our online courses who don't have internet access were able to go to like Starbucks coffee houses and use their internet. Those were all closed and uh, a bad solution, but one that worked was to um, have them drive in cars closer to our campus, sit in a parking lot and use the internet um, live. So it was, it was the internet access was more of an issue for us. That's, that's an interesting response, actually. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Excellent. Um, I think I might move on to the next the next question, which has was r raised in the questions, which was the qu which was the issue of, of preparing our students. So if we assume that they've got some technology and an opportunity to access the Internet, then what sort of preparation do our students need in order to engage with this different type of learning? Uh, Whitney, would you like to share some of your experiences in that area? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the type of student who is best prepared to learn online is often not the same student who wants to learn face to face. And so um, the, the pivot that happened in the spring wasn't ideal for students who had chosen to learn in a face to face environment. Uh, that shift for them wasn't what they self-selected. So when we're preparing students to move into an online program, 
or get started in an online program, we prepare a student orientation for those learners to help them become familiar with the digital tools that they will need to use on a regular basis so that they become familiar with the, the ways that they would submit assignments, the different ways that they might um, use digital tools to be able to um, engage with one another or engage with their professor or engage with the content, right? So all of that um, barrier to entry is greatly reduced. Uh, we'll also um, prepare them with some, uh, some time management tips, some best practices for study skills and things of the like so that they're better prepared to um, be successful in that online environment. Uh, so, uh, and students self-select uh, intentionally, right? So I have four children. One of my four children really wants to go to school online. The other three would really rather go to school face-to-face. -face. And so I could say, you know, in my N of four, <laughs> the 25% would prefer to be online students than face-to-face -face students. Now it's, you know, not statistically significant, but you know, my case study says that 25% is uh, the rough number here in my household. So hopefully that's useful information. Thank you. I think most definitely the challenge that uh, higher education and uh, college education is facing in the autumn is that many of our students will have to study online uh, because of continued impacts of the pandemic. So that really raises a, a question that was um, put in the um, in the panel, which was to say, should we just pause? pause at the education until uh, people can get back into the building in the same way uh, that they did in the past. I thought that was a really interesting uh, question and, and I would like the panel to think about a response to that. So should we pause and if not, why not? I don't want people to put their life on hold. Right. So, so one of the other things to consider is right now, there's this great opportunity to continue continue your education so that you can get back to work when this is over, right? So, and yes, the world might look different and your job may actually be remote. There are a lot of companies that are considering remote work in the future simply because the pandemic is changing the way they think about office space and cultures of remote work. Uh, so the, the work itself might change, but there's no reason you have to stop your education simply because the buildings aren't open. Now there are things about pieces of our education, and I think Matt spoke brilliantly about some of the medical bits that need some face-to-face -face components or clinical experiences. Some of those pieces have to be done in either a face-to-face -face environment or we have to think differently about how those experiences happen. But I wouldn't want students to stop learning in this moment when this is the best time ever to continue your education. Can I? Ayana, please join us. Uh, yes, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, I think you're right. It's a great moment to really reflect on what has happened. Will we ever be back to where we were before uh, COVID-19? I mean, that is, that's, that's a question. And it's also a good opportunity to address this issue of, because we depend on internet for everything now, and whether we have the uh, kind of the drive to get policy changes at government level is it to get those uh, satellites up there and get more internet out to every remote community and we as a, as a as a team of educators develop more and more mobile uh, applications which are accessible to more people than uh, others and in terms of um, I think I, I really also wanted to uh, answer that question on how we prepare our learners. One of the one of the lessons we have learned is that we have we have to prepare our students for assessment. We moved our uh, final year exams online to a 24 hour open book exam and the, the, the shock and the discontent of the students because they were just not prepared. They wanted an exam where they walk into exam hall, sit down for two hours and write it. When they were told you can do it at home on your own time for 24 hours, they were seriously unhappy 
they didn't want to do that. So I think in preparation, yes, we really need to prepare students for learning and we also really need to really rethink what is assessment, what is assessment online, how do we do that assessment to move away from those unseen examinations. Matt, did you want to come in on that? Because I know certainly you've done some really innovative work around assessments um, in this time of pandemic. Yeah, so we had to use a variety of tools. Um, I think I would agree with Iona that we uh, tried to shift people to more of an open book and um, essay type questions. But for some of those very high stakes um, medical exams where they're trying to prepare to take a multiple choice medical exam for their license, we had to uh, rely on fairly expensive proctoring services, live proctoring services. And some of these were human watches then, but a lot of these now are based on artificial intelligence where it's looking for certain patterns. It brings those patterns up and then the professor gets to review the tape. Uh, we found that the uh, false positive, in other words, the uh, number of suspicious activities that artificial intelligence picks up are, are super high and uh, a little stress for, for our professors. But um, And then the uh, critiques and the uh, some of the things on clinical rounds, we did a lot of telehealth and um, physicians with cameras on their head so students were safe at home, but they could talk to patients. Some of that was done live and we could ask the same questions as we could before, but um, the technology is a little more clunky than I thought it would be. Yeah, absolutely, I think we've had a similar experience at the University of London um, with, the, with the live proctoring. It's certainly challenging. <laughs> um, if I may panel, I'd like to, to turn now to um, the request from the audience for some very um, practical approaches to designing online learning. So Iona, you, you've shared with us um, your, um, sorry, mind mentor approach. Um, did you want to say a little bit more about the, the way in which you might use that in an asynchronous mapped to synchronous activity? Yes, I think um, the, the, in, as um, Whitney said, the, the design, the learn, learning design has to map the learners. Some learners like to be very active asynchronously. So the given given the time to develop something and then post it is one way of doing it. So mind mapping, uh, th that's a very much an interactive, a synchronous software where everyone can draw on the mind map at the same time and that's to make sure the facilitators can then see everyone doing something but i think the asynchronous tools that allow students to be creative specifically very creative and then because young um, learners tend to be very creative and they can come up with their own way of presenting something to us as well and i think um that that's where that, that where co-creation with students is really i think an opportunity here to move forward and getting learners on to the design as well and to move forward but the the the, the challenge i think is the time and the resource because these are these are these cannot be done uh, overnight these, these require planning, these require structuring, and then we also have all the quality controls to manage and quality assurance systems to uh, deal with uh, in higher education. So there are some challenges, but I think it's it's a really great opportunity, opportunity at, the, at this moment to do things. Thanks, Ayana, that's excellent. Tierney, can I perhaps bring you in on this issue of preparing the students for online learning and then um, having a collaborative, co-creative type of experience. We're not hearing you, Tierney. Possibly you're on mute. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. Um, so we, for helping uh, the learners 
uh, to um, to better uh, learn by distance because we already were, were in the move of uh, learning how to learn uh, and learning by doing and uh, uh, now we have to uh, teach them uh, learn how to distance learn uh, which means um, getting the good habits and uh, and uh, as we are dealing with continuous learning and uh, people that are working uh, and learning, which is such a challenge, uh, they have to really um, uh, be aware of how to uh, deal with their time for learning, especially uh, with uh, uh, people that were, they were distance working at home plus learning, which was, uh, I think, quite uh, stressing. Um, and, um, uh, so, th so th this this was really uh, and 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 about the assessment, um, we did quite we tested some peer to peer assessment uh, to have some uh, co creation and, and uh, because Moodle ha has a perfect tool to do that and uh, um, they, they were quite happy about this, um, but we also tested flipped classroom. And I can tell you in our uh, environment, it doesn't really work because for uh, workers uh, that don't have such more, such time to work before. Uh, so they really prefer lecture from the really sense of the of the word reading something to them, uh, but not really reading. But a lecture with a virtual classroom uh, is really uh, um, uh, the, 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 the way they are happy with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one, one last question, um, and which I'm hoping might frame some of the discussion that, that the panel uh, will provide in terms of picking up on themes, is really um, building on what Tiena has just been talking about around um, student engagement. So how do we keep our students engaged um, and how do we um, design learning opportunities that meet the wide range of, of student approaches? So some students who do uh, because of their personal circumstances or because of their preference uh, just want to be uh, the receiver of information compared to those who want to co-create. How do we how do we work on that? So I'm going to invite the panel to um, present their their final thoughts on some of the themes and it may be that they, they want to pick up on there. So um, was, in terms of the panel, we didn't decide who would go first. Um, is there somebody who would particularly like to start at this point? OK, well, I'll, if not, I'll go with the with the order that we had at, um, for the presentations, if that's OK. So, Sam, if I could turn to you, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I sometimes worry about engagement as a term. It's cropping up a lot at the moment, and I don't think engagement is an end in itself. You know, if we're led by the learning outcomes, it's 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 helping students. It's creating the conditions for learning that help students to meet those outcomes. And I worry sometimes that we, we, we do a lot to, to feel that we are fostering engagement and we build that into our learning designs. And sometimes it's for the sake of it. My auntie, who is now in her 70s, um, actually studied with the University of London decades ago. She, you know, she, she failed her 11 plus exam, aged 11, went to secondary modern. She did a teaching qualification and she's an autodidact. She, she loves learning remotely, always has. She's since got a degree with the Open University. And she said to me when I took this job at London, actually, she said, oh, I really enjoyed it, but I stopped doing it when they wanted all that endless discussion. <laughs> so, so it doesn't suit that, it does, you know, engagement for the sake of it doesn't suit everybody. Um, just as it doesn't when 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 we're thinking about a campus based education and the other funny thing that happens and always happens when we talk about online education and digital pedagogy is that we end up asking fundamental questions about teaching in general you know and learning in general um, and sometimes i worry that special that we, we apply special criteria to online education where we needn't necessarily do so you know, we know that people find different ways to learn. Um, we know that and we know we, we have, you know, myriad different um, 
learning design approaches and methodologies that we can use um, in the UK and, and at London at the moment we're using the ABC uh, method that came out of UCL which is, is proving very popular but there are many 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 and this science of education goes back decades and decades and decades well before the internet so there's lots of stuff out there on how to structure online courses to provide um, the conditions in which students can learn successfully and that includes things like building in feedback points, making sure that the discussions are facilitated and pegged to activities and outcomes, uh, making sure that assessment is aligned to outcomes, um, um, using assessment so that it drives learning as well as just measures it. There's loads of stuff out there about that. What I'm interested in at the moment and here today is how we can learn from other kinds of online learn learning outside the outside the formal academy and apply some of those lessons inside. Thanks, Sam. Whitney, can I invite you next? Absolutely. Um, so just to piggyback on what Sam said, um, you know, I, when I think about student engagement, I think about student to student engagement student to teacher or instructor engagement and student to content engagement. And I think oftentimes when we think about student engagement, we think about the student who raises their hand in class and answers a question or um, and, and maybe we also are thinking about the student that's not raising their hand in class or engaged in that conversation, but are they still engaged? Right. And in digital learning environments, uh, most students can be more engaged than the student that isn't raising their hand in class because you can set up your discussions so that every student has to post before they can see what everyone else actually posts. Right. So now every student gets the opportunity to be the first person to respond, right? So now they're they're not hearing the first person respond and then formulating their response based on that. So they're actually having to think and formulate before they hear someone else or read someone else's thoughts. So is that person that's sitting in the back of the room that's not raising their hand actually as engaged as the student that is in the online environment and having to post first? I don't know the answer to that question. I think I might, but we'd, we'd probably need to read some research on that, right? And then I think about some of the affordances of some of the tools online, right? There's synchronous tools, there are asynchronous tools, but then there's this new suite of tools that I like to call pseudo-synchronous, right? So it's this use of voice and video in an environment that allows for a student to post a voice or video comment or discussion or a performance that allows for their peers or their instructor to give them feedback or critique or discuss or comment on those posts in time stamped kind of feedback method or in a commentary kind of format that gives that student a kind of conversational dialogue in a voice and video based format. Now this gets back to your comments earlier about access equity, uh, um, internet access, device access. So uh, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far, but there are these tools that allow for this more robust internet of today kind of um, uh, affordance. So we have the ability to move in that direction. And then uh, to Sam's comment earlier about feedback. So again, getting to engagement on the part of the instructor, when we start thinking about feedback, how robust can that be and how important is feedback? Well, it's about the timeliness. It's uh, I used to say feedback is a dish best served warm, right? So it's timeliness, it's frequency, it's distribution. It needs to be individualized. So the the all this engagement isn't just on the part of the student. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Whitney. Excellent. Um, Matt, may I draw you in now, please? I think um, uh, a, a surprise, a COVID surprise that we've um, come across as we're trying to relaunch is this uh, dichotomy between the expectations of the and wishes of the students and that of the faculty. So uh, we did a survey of our students and McKinsey, um, the consulting firm did a, a national survey and they both enforced the fact that 
almost 90% of students really want to come back to campus. And that's for social reasons and for um, learning styles and what they're used to from K to 12. And, uh, and the majority of faculty are very nervous about coming back to, uh, for health reasons. And I, that may just be the um, being 18 year old and invincible part of a, a young person um, rather than people my age who might feel uh, less safe to come back. And I think the key, I think, is really engagement is how the expectations of how you'll engage your students. And um, and I think that students, uh, at least in our survey, one uh, saw engagement as both inside uh, the learning, the classroom, but also outside the classroom. And uh, if those sorts of uh, activities are not available to them, we're, uh, we've been struggling with that. Matt, I think you raised some really, really important points there about um, uh, how faculty or staff who are involved in this um, are, are feeling and, are able, and able to engage and, and recognising that, that we too have had internet access issues and cats climbing on our shoulders and young children to, to manage and homeschool as well <laughs> as our students and that has added to some significant complexity. Iona, if you would like to join us for the last input Hi. from the panel, thank you. I just want to, um, I, I think uh, Whitney and Matt and Sam have said quite most of what we, I agree as well. I just want to pick, just pick on the learning materials um, because way back from we have moved from correspondence courses, getting people to read and, and then, and we, this, that's not the expectation anymore. Nobody wants to read. Students want all the learning materials delivered if they are delivered in lecture format, video lectures, PowerPoint presentations with audio and videos per se to explain facts. That that reading culture is, I don't know what the panel think, but I think we are finding it very difficult to get our students to read as we have in the past expected. They want everything presented on a very interactive, uh, maybe it's, it's the, the nature of things, it's the way things are moving. I mean, we ourselves want to watch a video if you want to learn something new. If I want to fix something, I'll quickly watch a YouTube video and see how is that thing achieved, rather than sitting down and reading a manual, how to fix that. So I think it's, that's the way it is moving and we can't stop that. But I think the question to ask is, are we, are we by promoting that, are we missing an, a very important aspect of uh, uh, learning through reading? That, that sometimes worry me that uh, this, this whole, a whole moving forward, uh, maybe, maybe not. I think that's a really interesting uh, uh, question. And uh, um, somebody who listens to audio books mostly rather than reading books these days. Uh, I, it's a really good, a good challenge to us all. Tiene, um, you're in the wonderful position of uh, of closing our panel discussion today. Uh, can I invite you for your, your final thoughts, please? Thank you so much. Um, so my problem is the scope at CNAM is not engagement of students, but engagement for continuous learning so of workers. So uh, enroll, when you enroll to CNAM, you already have a, a goal. You already have a career goal. You have a, um, so uh, the issue is not from the learner's engagement. Uh, it can be from the teacher engagement, of course, because um, during the crisis, uh, they told us uh, they were overwhelmed with work, overwhelmed with uh, follow up of the uh, of the learners, uh, follow up of the all the questions of, uh, on the forums and, and during the lectures. Uh, so that that is really uh, something which is um, uh, we have to look for and um, even by um, so we are, we are not going for a massive 
um, uh, pure distance learning uh, uh, plan, uh, we, we will have blended uh, plan uh, as, as um, uh, CNAM is, uh, has offices all around France. So that means uh, anybody has a, a CNAM office near, I would say, uh, 30 of one hour uh, 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 by car uh, and they can meet people, they can use computers, they can have um, um, question and answers about their or orientation and career. Uh, so, uh, um, and as for the reading from I Iona, I, I would add uh, something which is really, uh, I'm really looking for that, uh, which is the new frontier using, using virtual reality because uh, the headsets are now uh, can can be um, uh, purchased by anyone. It's it's the same price as as a smartphone, and uh, we are really looking into the effect of memorization during the virtual reality, uh, using it as a, uh, a fantastic tool for vocational um, uh, training. So that will be my last word because um, at fall we will uh, uh, begin a big plan on, on uh, producing modules on uh, virtual reality. Fantastic, that's a very exciting place for the panel to end. Thank you very much, fascinating. I'm going to hand over if I may now to my colleague Tim Gore. Um, who's a CEO and director of the um, Paris campus, the Institute in Paris for the University of London. Tim, are you available just to, to sum up some of the experiences you've had this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're logging in from? Um, good afternoon. To, yeah, it's definitely afternoon here in Paris and good afternoon to everyone. I think it's been a, a fascinating discussion. Um, and I think uh, I really like to thank the audience for being so great. The, the questions are really great questions. And I think they're going to be a really useful starting point for us to think about the next step in this conversation, uh, because we've, we've gathered together this really exciting group of, of experts and we're not going to let them go that easily. So we're going to think about what's the next, the next step in this, in this uh, process of of discussion and I think that's that's going to be really exciting. So we'll get back to you on that. Uh, but meanwhile, from Paris, from Dallas, from Philadelphia and from London, and I think I've um, captured everyone in, in that geographical scope. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mark Dinverno, my, my colleague from Goldsmiths, University of London, Deputy Principal and Responsible for International there, was meant to do the opening and unfortunately got locked out through um, one of the, the hazards of, of working in this virtual space. But Mark, uh, a good friend and colleague, uh, we've worked together for many, many years and on, on his behalf, uh, on behalf of Goldsmiths University of London and on my behalf, uh, University of London Institute in Paris, uh, we'd really like to thank Whitney, Sam, Iona, Matt, Linda and Thierry for a really fascinating discussion. Um, we, we like to think that it's the beginning of a, a discussion, so uh, we'll get back to you on that, but we'll, we'll certainly see where we get to. But I think you've certainly um, addressed some of the real uh, interesting uh, topics that we need to think about. Um, topics of, of inclusion, topics of humanization, topics from Iona of how to deal with large animals in <laughs> at a distance, which is great. Uh, and many, many, many other interesting insights. So. You know, I'd really like to uh, to thank you all for that and thank the audience. And uh, thank you, Linda, for, for chairing this. You've done a fantastic job of that. And uh, and recommend to all of you, actually, that you pop down and see, um, Thierry was saying that you're never far from a Le Canam uh, campus. And um, they have a fascinating museum there, uh, Musée des de Arts et Métiers. And I really recommend that you go and drop in and have a look at that. It's a, it's a fascinating place. So um, thank you to all the support from the Centre for Distance Education, from the University of London, from Thomas Jefferson University, from the Royal Veterinary College, from iDesign and University of London worldwide. Um, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, and thanks everybody for joining us today for the future of social, creative and experiential digital learning. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.